Hello, and welcome to the Motherhood Village podcast. I have a very special guest. Her name is Jamar Armani, who is a community midwife that believes in the transformative and healing power of birth and that every baby has a human right to human milk. Love that. Her mission is to do her part to build a movement for birth justice locally, nationally, and globally. Jamara is the architect of the Birth Justice Framework, the Black Midwives Model of Care, and the Birth Justice Bill of Rights. Jamara identifies as Black, Femme, and Queer. Welcome, Jamara. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me today. Thanks for coming on. Before we dive into the main part of the conversation, let's do my icebreaker round. So do you have a favorite book or one you would like to recommend? Mm, favorite book? Probably Octavia Butler, Parable of the Sower. Okay. What are the values that guide you and your family? Ooh, that's a big one. <laughs> um, I would say, so the values that guide me and my family, the, the very first one, of course, would be love. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, respect. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say there's a value around being holistic as in tied to the earth and to um, kind of a natural way of living. Um, And there's a lot of respect for emotional wellness in my family. Um, So kind of taking care of each other's hearts and emotions. Um, And I would also say autonomy So kind of respecting the other person and their boundaries and their sovereignty. Um, What else? There's a deep respect for culture. So we have um, kind of a center, a center around Afrocentric or Pan-African culture and this belief that as Black folks, we're all unified worldwide. Um, So we do a lot of deep digging into African culture in my family um, and not just Africa in terms of the continent, but the diaspora and Black history and and all of that. And we've been homeschoolers for a long time. So um, there's a strong focus on reading and education and and all of that. Um, And then I would lastly, uh, this is a long list. um, I (laughs) I love it. Two more things. I would say home birth. Um, So I'm a midwife, as you know, but um, also my children, my two youngest were born at home. And it was a family experience. Love it. Um, so it's a big part of how we kind of see ourselves as homeschoolers and home birthers. Sure. And then lastly, I would say um, that we are a queer and trans inclusive family. So um, I'm queer, my partner's queer, my oldest son is trans. Um, and I think young people are always like questioning their sexuality and kind of figuring out who they are. And there's a lot of openness in that around my family, in my family. I love that. Thank you for being so honest with that. And may I ask, what are the ages of your children? 21, 16, 10, and 9. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm so intrigued. I love when I, when I start talking with my guests and she, they hit some points and I'm like, oh, I need to ask about that and, you know, dive deeper into who my guest is as opposed to just reading a bio, right? Because you could read right. someone's bio, but there's so much more layers and levels. Um, So definitely super excited to speak with you. Okay. How has motherhood transformed you? I was mothered. (laughs) So motherhood transformed me because I was mothered. Um, Mm -hmm. I come from a lineage of strong mothers. So we can trace back my family seven generations, um, mostly based in the South, uh, the Southern United States, um, Louisiana. Um, And so to my knowledge, we are mostly firstborn daughters. Um, And so there's a strong line, a long line of strong mothers. Um, So I was blessed to be raised by my great, great grandmother, my great grandmother, my grandmother and my mother, and have them all influence my life at different points in different ways. Um, So I was first transformed by being mothered and being grandmothered. I also became a mother at the age of 19. Um, So most of my, I always say that most of my adult life, I've been a mother. Uh, So yeah, it's really what I know. I remember initially with my first pregnancy being scared, but also excited and also feeling like I was entering this gateway that um, 
it was kind of like a door of no return. Um, I didn't know how it would change my life, but I knew that I would never be the same. Um, and then I would have to grow up very quickly and figure a lot of things out. Um, there wasn't enough support for me as a young mother. Um, and looking back and knowing what I know now and also being someone who mothers mothers and midwives mothers, um, I know that for sure there was not a, enough support for sure. me. So it changed a lot in terms of how I had to live my life because I had to survive, but also just in terms of my political consciousness around, I was already an activist from a young age, from like the age of 15, but I didn't have this understanding of like, oh, there's this aspect of social justice that's about the, the family and like how we, yes. the resources that we have access to in order to form our families. So I think it developed my political consciousness in that way of just expanding it to be like, oh, there's this whole aspect of gender justice and um, of reproductive of rights, reproductive rights, reproductive rights. And mm-hmm. productive justice. And eventually for me, that transformed into birth justice, which is a framework I developed years later, but it was really seeded, seeded by my experience as a young mother. Sure. And it takes a village to raise a child and a village to uplift a mother. Who and what, I always say there's more than just a who, um, who and what has been a part of your motherhood village? Mm. Well, first and foremost, my mother (laughs) has been the center of my motherhood village. Um, Even last week, I had to go to a conference out of the country and my mother came in to stay with the kids, stay with her grandkids so that I could travel. Um, So I'm very blessed to have that support. Um, I've also really been um, blessed to be able to be a part of communities of mothers, um, particularly communities of single mothers um, and mothers who need support for various reasons in different ways. And um, we we used to call it our circle of light when my kids were young. We had this circle of mothers that, you know, we knew that if my kids need dinner tonight, I have a house yeah. to go to, or if I need to run off to a birth, I have somewhere to drop them off. Um, so I've really been a part of several different networks of mothers and parents that have kind of been this web that have supported each other because we needed to survive together. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really a huge part of how I got to where mm-hmm. I am. I, I know I wouldn't have gotten through midwifery school without this web of mothers that were all invested in like my success and knowing that that meant helping raise my children. And, that and that how be- did you find that village for yourself? Like how did, how did that develop and find, because I know several single moms, friends of mine. Um, I mean, I always say I started my motherhood journey later in life. I was 34, 35 when I had my son. So a lot of my friends had their children in their 20s, right? So I had seen what it was, um, and even family members, the struggle of a single mother. So how did you build what seems like such a wonderful community of mothers that you can say, look, I have things to do. I have to be mid or whatever it is. I have to work. Okay, I know there's such and such. I think that's what a lot of people look for and want, whether you're a single mother or a dual family household. But how did you find that? Um. So sometimes serendipity, um, sometimes tenacity, like it's not here and I have to build it literally. Uh, Yes. Um, Sometimes I I would say like, I remember particularly when I moved to Atlanta, um, I was looking around and trying to figure out like, where, where is this community? Um, And it was really through what I call the culture community. So um, like folks who are like-minded around kind of Pan-African, Afrocentric culture, kind of finding each other through different networks. Uh, Sometimes it was through the homeschooling community. um, And then most recently, I think since I've lived in Miami, it was really through the midwifery community. Um, So I remember when I first moved to Miami, I didn't know a soul. And the first person who was my friend was someone whose birth I had attended as a student midwife. Mm -hmm. And we got to talking and, you know, I told her like, I'm a single mom, I've got these kids and I'm trying to make it through school and how hard it is. And I hadn't yet found my community, even though I had been here for months. And she was like, oh, and she like invited me to something. She's like, that's solvable. Like there's, you know, <laughs> she kind of wrote me into her circle of friends. Um, and that became my community. Um, so I feel very blessed that, you know, I have kind of walked this path that has always led me to community, but I'm sure. also someone seeks it out. I think it really takes um, being humble 
um, being willing to trust people, um, which is not always easy and it doesn't always pan out well. And I'm not saying it's worked out every time, um, but being willing to try again when it doesn't um, and kind of a worldview that we deserve it, that our society is, is lacking. And I know I'm not going to get what I need from a job or a government or even a relationship, one relationship, right? That it's a web of community and a web of, of support that really carries us through, like you said, the village. Um, and I, like, I have a fundamental belief in that. Um, and I think that that is like a principle of manifestation. It keeps showing up, or at least the opportunity shows sure, up. Sure. Um, and and I know a lot of people don't have that. Yeah. And when, at the times I know what that feels like. And at the times when I didn't, I remember feeling very isolated, alone, destitute, and and then kind of getting up eventually and being like, I have to find it, or I have to build it, or I have to create it. I mean, there's been times where I've like literally made a pay, a post on Facebook, like, where are the mothers? Um, or hung up a sign and been like, drop off your kids. Can I drop off mine too? You know? Um, so I've, I've pretty much my whole life been a community organizer. And I think that that's part of how I've created that village is, is literally organizing people around sure. this belief that we, we need each other. Well, and I think it's it's so important that you do put out there um, the tenacity of it, because I think to some extent, yes, like we we want to rely and think that the 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 workforce is you know the company that we work for is going to help us or whatever institution or whatever it is that it's just going to be given to us. And I'm a firm believer, like yeah, you got to work for it. Like I'm I'm a big believer in manifestation, a big spiritual person of you know karma and what I put out in the world and all of these things and work with my integrity. I lead by my my gut and things. Um, but at the same time, I need to do the work, right? Like I can't just sit there hoping that if I put it on a board or put it on a list or say, well, I need this, I really want this without putting some effort into it, it's it's null and void. So I think that's really big because, and I know it's overwhelming and I would imagine more so back then because you said your youngest was is nine, correct? My youngest is nine, my oldest is Yeah, and nine. I say all that because now we're in the digital age. So you see all the mom groups. I mean, I'm a part of one mom group here in just the Coral Springs Coral, uh, Margate, um, Coconut Creek area, I think it has like 8,000 members and you always see, I need a mom this, I need a, so I think it's it's much easier to a certain extent now and you see moms like, hey, looking for a play date or this. To some extent, not easier, but maybe just not plentiful, but kind of just more, it's there where I would imagine you being a mom, like there was no Facebook groups that you were just like, hey, I need this and this, you know? It was who you knew, what you knew, and you kind of put out there. But um, yeah, thank you for sharing that because I think it is so important to know that you do have to kind of put it put it out there and, and really seek it. Um, yeah, and I remember it even go like ahead. a decade ago when it was like, I would go on, on meetup.com. I don't even know. Oh. If it still I, I... <laughs> but it was before we had social media. So you had this mm -hmm. meetup and I would type in like black homeschoolers in, you wow. know, whatever city I was living in. And that was sometimes you'd find like one or two other people that were also looking to form a meetup around this yeah. same, you know, kind of uh, notion of culture and community. Mm -hmm. But it was hard. I'm not saying it was easy at all. And For I will, sure. I just want to say one more thing about that, because I think sometimes in these conversations, the onus is put on the individual to like, you need to try harder or work harder. Um, and I'm saying that we have, that I know that we can't rely on a company or a government or an institution, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't. Like our government and our society should yes. be more responsible for this collective 100%. creation of support for parents and families. That yes. doesn't exist. And so individuals have to do the work that our society and our government should be doing, but it really should be even parentless people feeling a, I'm sorry, um, childless people um, feeling a responsibility to then support people who are parenting children. Um, and so, it doesn't exist, so we have to create it, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't it's be there. That you don't have it because <laughs> it should be there. A hundred percent. I mean, yeah, we yeah. can probably have a whole thing on, you know, the parental leave issue. And I mean, that's one of the reasons I struggled after having my son. So that's a whole nother thing um, and massive, right? That's not even something that's a small thing. So I completely yeah. agree. Um, okay. Yeah, parental so now, leave should be like a year. <laughs> you know, yes. it should be 
paid. Yes. It should be a year off. It should be the time to build community and bond and, 100%. you know, identify, like grow as a parent. Like it's a huge job and we I don't get paid. I had my employer tell me at the time, because I was a high level executive, you're coming back to work, right? You're coming back to, and this was my first child. So because, I mean, I just, I mean, I've always been a hard worker and all the labels, right? Ambitious. And I'm like, oh, absolutely. They're like, you're coming back, right? Three months, right? To the point that they even mentioned me having a C-section so that they would know my timetable of when I was coming. Oh yeah. It's a whole, a whole thing. Um, and Cringy. I was playing, I, huh? Cringing, I'm right. Cringing. I eventually had a home birth um, and I didn't even tell many people because I didn't want them to to put any like negative energy, even though it had started with the with the negative connotations. Well, what happens if this? What happens if that? And once I, I was like, OK, I, I need to stop. And it's really none of their business how I choose to birth my child. But the fact that he even thought that that was OK to mention that and the pressure I didn't realize till years later of that implanted in my mind so that during my maternity leave, which I only got really three months, I still felt obligated to check in with my team and rush into work when truthfully I should have been able to ask for more time or have what they call like a lead in, you know, where instead of me going full force after just having this life transformative experience to say, hey, I think I should probably start in slowly. But that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother kit and caboodle. I want to really get into- no, it's so part of it though. It's all part of the same caboodle. 100%, <laughs> which is, I know, a part of also that's going to go into everything that you've started and your bio. I mean, I only, re I only read a short portion of it. So when all of you listen to this, watch this and you read the, you read the bio in the short notes, she has an extensive bio. She's done amazing things. Um, so I want to dive into that. Okay. So I know you talked about, um, your journey and how you had your first child at 19. And then I'm, I know so much has happened in between then, but when was that shift when you knew you wanted to become a midwife? Did you have another career? thing in mind, what was that shift to become a midwife, you know, and what inspired you to go into the field of midwifery? So I knew that I wanted to be a midwife when I had my first child because I had a midwife. Uh, um, okay. When I was pregnant, I really didn't know what a midwife was. I found out kind of in the middle of my pregnancy. Um, and actually I'm so grateful to my OB because that I had it during that pregnancy because I would come in with all these questions and I one of at the end of one of the visits, she said, "Maybe you should have a midwife." Because I was asking all this <laughs> stuff about like, oh wow, yes, and breastfeeding and skin to skin and all these things. I had been like in the library. I worked. I as a I was a college student when I was pregnant, and my job was I worked in the library. That was my um, what do they call that thing? Work study. That was my oh, work yes. study. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in the library, so I was constantly reading. Um, and I got all the pregnancy books, they'd be stacked up, <laughs> you know, and, um, and so I would come in with all these questions in my OB that I had, um, that had been assigned through my student health plan. Um, she said at the end of one visit, maybe at around like when I was 20 weeks, she said, maybe you should have a midwife, you know, there's a midwife office down the hall. And I was like, like what the heck midwife? is that? Um, so, you know, I went uh, and found out what a midwife was and it was so different. It was radically different. I didn't feel rushed in the visits. She took her time to answer my questions. She had a couch yes. in her office. I was like, oh, like I'm supposed to sit and get comfortable. Um, she got on the floor, I remember one day, and like showed me yoga stretches that I could do for my back pain because I was taking Tylenol. She was like, I mean, you no. can. <laughs> and I was like, really? And so she showed me how to stretch, do the cat cow position and just like all this stuff. She listened to my drama, my like my relationship, baby daddy drama. Um, it was just so rich and full, and it was a relationship. Um, and and may I ask, to cut investing. you off briefly, was she a black midwife or a white midwife? Ah, she was a white midwife, a white wow. nurse midwife um, in Pennsylvania. I was in Philly. Okay. Her name is Libby Cohen. Um, I think she has since retired from midwifery, but she was phenomenal. She was old school. Um, nice. And I mean, that was 20 years ago, but she was old school for, for even for that time. Old school meaning like values, like she really valued like building a re relationship sure. um, with her clients and she was in private practice, which a lot of nurse midwives are not. Um, so anyway, she she was, you could tell that she was really invested in building this relationship with me. And when I had my baby, she sat by, by my bed and I remember, you know, her encouraging me to get up and move and even when I didn't feel like it and just all of these like really loving things. Like I'd fall asleep and I'd wake up and she'd be still sitting right there kind of reading wow. the paper, drinking coffee. And, 
And then eventually I was like, oh, I'm going to push this baby and have baby in two pushes. She put the baby on my chest. Um, it was a beautiful experience. And I was like, I want to do that for people. And I had two other college friends who were pregnant at the same time as me, and they didn't have as maybe loving, caring an experience as I did. And I was like, oh, okay, there are differences in how this plays out for people based on who their providers are. And I kind of got that early on. Um, and I was already an activist. Like I said, I was a campus activist. I started being very vocal about it. And I knew that I wanted to be a midwife, but I had this picture, maybe because Libby was my midwife, but also just the pictures of midwives that we have, like this granny, you know, picture. So I thought like, oh, that's something I'll do way later in life, like <laughs> my grandmother. Yes, good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the calling just kind of kept nagging at me. And, and then when I had my second child, I had a radically different experience. I was in a different state. I was in Georgia. Um, I could not find a midwife that was covered by my health plan at the time. And I had an OB who um, wasn't terrible. She was okay. She was a black OB. She was more on the holistic side. But the nurses, when I gave birth, were horrible. Um, I had one nurse, a uh, white nurse, that told me that if I didn't stay in the bed, it would kill my baby. Um, I ended up laboring alone. You know, I had a doula. She was awesome. She was, my, she was actually my best friend. Um, but she was like kind of running interference with the nurse so that I could labor alone in the bathroom. Um, wow. So I wasn't alone in a sense, but I was alone in the sense that like I didn't feel supported by the institution that I was birthing in. So I'm like laboring on the toilet. Eventually, you know, I give birth. It's, it's fine. Um, but it was a battle. And I, and I said afterwards, I will never give birth in a hospital again. And I didn't. My next two babies I had at home. Um, and so I, at that time, that calling just kept nagging at me, just like, you are supposed to do this for people because there's not enough people doing, <laughs> doing, sure. um, creating safe space for birth. Um, and so I followed that calling, moved to Florida and enrolled in midwifery school, but I actually started apprenticing with a midwife in Georgia. I just kind of followed her around for about a year. Um, and, and she was such an inspiration. So I it just... I had these dreams, like it was just like this calling just would not leave me alone. Um, and I knew that it was like what I needed to do. And then finding out that black women are dying at um, disproportionate rates to their white counterparts, um, like three to four times as, as often. Um, and that, and, and because I was already a racial justice activist and a reproductive justice activist, putting those pieces together and kind of understanding like, there's a gap here where um, maternal health is not being valued um, and particularly black maternal health. Um, and that inspired me to follow that calling that had been nagging at me, kind of give up everything that I was doing and, and just be like, I'm going back to school. And I went to midway free school um, and I've been licensed in Florida for about nine years. That's amazing. So I want to ask you this question about midwifery before we get into the back mortality rate and all of that and, and your inspiration behind starting your organizations. But mm -hmm. it, it, it bothers me to no end when I'm on, you know, the Facebook sites and I see articles about, I don't know, there was something about a, a home birth or something and the comments of people that just don't know. And they're like, who would ever give birth at home? That's so, ir I think, irresponsible. Um, and of course, when I see that, I want to respond of, of anger because I'm like, wait a minute, wait, that's like so wrong. Like I, you know, had a home birth and actually statistics, whatever, but I don't have the, um, to be able to eloquently say, you know, like, no, the misconceptions are this, and it's actually safe to this. So I want to give you the floor since you've been a midwife for nine years. I know again, from having my own home birth and having the most wonderful midwives, my husband's mid, um, aunt is a midwife, um, in Trinidad. And she actually mm. I think was like the chapter present for the national midwifery of like the whole Western, like Caribbean and all of that. So I've been around it. I understand. I'm sorry. What's her name? Deborah Lewis. Yeah. I knew that's what you were talking about. As soon as you said it, I love Debbie. Yes. <laughs> that's my, that's my aunt-in-law. A lot of respect for her. She is a pioneer, particularly yes. in Caribbean um, midwifery. Yes. 
And um, even when she found out I was pregnant, she never like even pushed it. And then when I told her I was having a home birth, she was like, yes. But I say all that to say, I know her story, right? I've heard the conversation. So I understand the level of training you have to go through and the birds you have to do and all of that. So use this as your platform to speak on it of what the misconceptions are and why women can feel safe knowing if they have a home birth or birthing center. Speak on that. Sure. Um, so that's probably the number one question that I get. Um, I meet with a lot of families that want to explore this idea of home birth or birth center. Um, and oftentimes there are some reservations or hesitations or questions around how safe is this? Yeah. Um, and, and the safety issues that arise from out of hospital birth usually relate to the lack of institutional support. Um, and the type of environment or climate um, where the person is giving birth. So I'll give you an example. Um, I am in Florida, which is a state that licenses midwives, and there are certain regulations um, for home births to occur uh, within 30 minutes of a hospital, for um, birth center births to occur within, I think it's five miles of a hospital, um, and for midwives to be um, trained at a certain level, um, the competencies that are um, required in Florida are match the international standards. And as we know, the rest of the world understands a lot more about maternal health um, and infant health than um, the United States. So I feel I feel safe as a provider knowing that I've been trained um, based on um, ICM or international um, standards. Um, and... And so I think that um, when those conditions are in place that help to keep midwifery safe and, um, and to keep families safe, um, giving birth at home and birth centers, then um, we can have a lot of confidence in what um, the outcomes are. Um, and the research kind of bears this out. I think that when um, there are laws against midwifery or out of hospital birth that are hostile and that um, are that mean that transporting in the event of emergencies isn't safe um, or isn't um, kind of welcoming, then it makes people feel less safe and it makes for worse outcomes. Um, so rural environments where there aren't hospitals, for example, where people have to travel potentially hours um, to get to a hospital can make home birth unsafe. Um, lack of training and support for providers, um, for midwives can make home birth unsafe. Criminalization or targeting of midwives can make home birth unsafe. But in general, when we can support midwives to have the training, supplies, access to medication and institutional support that they need, home birth and birth center birth becomes a lot safer. Um, so that's what I would say to that in general. Now, it's yeah. talking to individual families, so that's like kind of a systems level right. analysis. Um, but talking to individual families, what I usually talk about um, is the fact that we do a lot of prevention work, right? Mm -hmm. So midwives, um, particularly in my state, only um, are, are um, designed to attend low risk um, birth which means that usually what we do is we establish a relationship with our clients during their pregnancy. We assess them for risk. So there's actually a risk assessment form that my clients complete um, to determine if they have any health history that might be concerning or any current health conditions, which may mean that giving birth um, in a um, low resource setting might be um, dangerous or potentially complicated for them. Um, so things like hypertension, things like history of um, birth complications, mm -hmm. um, things like diabetes that's unmonitored, unchecked, um, those types of things. Like the might, underlying issues, yes. Yeah, might become complicated in birth. And so those folks, I may be able to provide them prenatal care, but when it comes time to give birth, I would contact a physician um, and, you know, develop a relationship so that the physician knows when it comes time to give birth, this person is going to deliver in the hospital because it's not the safest for them to give birth at home. So the baseline is low risk, normal, healthy. That's the good candidate for giving birth at home. Now, 
does do unpredictable things occur in birth? Yes. So you can have a totally healthy, um, you know, low risk person that can become high risk during birth. It's less likely that if they're healthy person that those complications will arise, but it is possible. So in that event, we already have an emergency care plan in place. Um, we have a transport plan to the hospital. Usually we already have a relationship with a provider that we can transport to, but if not, all hospitals have to accept, you know, transports. Um, and so we go through that. We make a plan. We understand where sure. the closest hospital is. I also carry things like oxygen and Pitocin for using after the birth in case of a hemorrhage. Myself and my staff are trained in neonatal resuscitation. So all of those things help to keep it as healthy as possible. I also carry herbs that can help to um, be kind of on the prevention side, like, oh, this mom is a little bit stressed out. We see her blood pressure going up just a little bit. So we're going to give her this herbal tea or this homeopathic. We're going to put her in a position to just kind of help calm things down. Um, put her on her side, put some pillows between her legs. So all of these things are like things that we use, different modalities to help keep things healthy. But we're starting with a healthy premise. We're using tools to keep things healthy during the both the birth and postpartum. And then we have an emergency care plan in place in the event, the unlikely event that an emergency occurs and we need to go to a hospital. So can we predict 100% of complications, no, but neither can hospitals. Um, right. And the majority of maternal and infant deaths occur in hospitals because that's where the majority of birth happens. Um, so home birth is not any less safe. Um, and in fact, we take even greater precautions because we have to consider things like the transport time. And everyone has the right to decide what sure. risks they're willing to take. Correct. And that's the part that I think we don't talk about a lot is informed choice and autonomy which are often really not respected in hospitals. Decisions are often made for people rather than it being a, um, a situation of shared decision-making. And midwifery, and one of the hallmarks of midwifery care is shared decision-making. Um, and so you're more likely to be involved in that decision and to be asked, well, what do you wanna do in this situation and presented with options if your provider is a midwife, particularly a home birth, or birth center midwife. It's really a hallmark and cornerstone of how we provide care. And so people often, you know, walk away um, after having completed their care with a midwife feeling like, oh, wow, I was really respected in that situation. My wishes, my birth plan was honored, whereas the opposite tends to occur in the hospital. Not all the time, but no. overwhelming majority of the time. So that's kind of the differences in what those care models look like. And in an emergency situation, do you want to be in a situation where your care provider is asking you and respecting your wishes? Or do you want to be you know, coerced or told um, what to do? We call it obstetric violence You know, when, um, when the, the birth is done on the terms of the provider against the will of their patient or client. Sure. Um, and, and I don't think anyone wants to experience obstetric violence, but the overwhelming majority of births that occur, particularly in the United States, are um, based in obstetric violence. And so my work has really been around educating people about that and being an interrupter of obstetric violence by providing an alternative model of care, which is really historical and ancestral and, and rooted in traditions that have kept people alive for millennia. Um, and that's the thing I think that we often forget is that birth only moved into the hospitals 100 years ago. Yep. <laughs> and that's one of the things I say. And thank you so much for eloquently explaining that, because I think, yeah, like sometimes I look and I'm like, but wait a minute, we've been giving birth since the beginning of time when hospitals were not there. You know, obviously, yet yeah, times have changed and things. But then if we get to the root cause of why hospitals were even created, like there's a whole, you know, the business of being born. I'm sure you've seen that documentary that helped me kind of propel. Um, but anyway, let's get into I want to give a stat here. According to the um, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, about 700 mothers die as a result of pregnancy or delivery related complications every year, and half of those deaths are considered preventable. But for Black women, there are disproportionately higher rates than that of white and even Hispanic women. Let's dive into this. Why is there such a big gap in health disparities? Why is the Black maternal mortality rate so high? And talk in some high-level things of how you think we can reduce the rate um, and the health disparities. What's the first step? And how we, you and I, even myself even, can do our part to bring those numbers down. 
That is a wonderful question. <laughs> Much of my um, journey has been based around answering this question. Um, so yes, as you stated, um, the health disparities, the racial health disparities as it relates to maternal and infant mortality are much higher um, for Black people. Um, so Black women are three to four times as likely to die as it relates to um, childbirth um, as compared to their white counterparts. I also just want to highlight, because I think this number often gets glossed over, Indigenous um, birthing people are yes. twice as likely to die as it relates to their white counterparts. Um, and so that is appalling. It is absolutely an injustice. The first time I heard those numbers, I was like, oh, that's a human rights violation. Yeah. Um, and especially when you consider that many of the deaths are preventable. Also just wanted to highlight the t statistic that um, Black infants are also twice as likely to die um, as compared to their white counterparts in the first year of life. Um, so there's been a lot of um, uh, media coverage and attention to the maternal mortality rate. And I, I can, actually came into this work through Black Infant Health, which is a program in California. And it was through the Long Beach, um, California Health Department that I worked with. Um, and I was um, an outreach worker through that program, even before I was mm -hmm. a midwife. So my first exposure really was through infant health and, the, and knowing the statistic that Black babies were dying at twice the rate in the first year of life and trying to understand how we could prevent yeah. those deaths of those babies. Um, and then through that work, um, uh, through an amazing a mentor that I had named Stephanie, she actually handed me an article that said, well, Black mothers are dying too. And I was like, what? And I was like mind blown that it was also mothers. Um, and it made me ask a lot more questions about like, it can't be mothers and babies. Like this is like, I what's know. going too on much. here? What's going on? Yeah. Too much. It's too much to, to process. Started doing research and reading every journal I could get my hands on to really understand like, what is at the root cause of this? Um, and I wanted to understand, like, is it genetic? Like, what is happening? Um, and I remember one research article that I read that talked about a study that was done on African immigrant women who came to the United States, didn't grow up here, but came, immigrated to the United States and gave birth here. Their birthing outcomes for maternal and infant health were com comparable to white women in the United States. So... I was mind blown by that, just like, wait, so it's not genetic. It can't be genetic. And that was really around, I want to say, the early 2000s when they had really started to tease out this research that said um, that it is really related to the experience of being a racialized person in the United States and centuries of oppression, generational trauma, um, which some call post-traumatic slave syndrome um, and epigenetics, right, all play a role. And um, pioneers um, like Dr. Michael Liu at the CDC um, were really looking into what are what is underlying here? Is it the prenatal oh, care? Um, you know, is it the nutrition? Is it poverty, right? And they were like ruling out all these things. Like, it's not this, it's not that. It's actually racism, like that was huge that all these studies kept bearing out that it's actually racism. And how do you quantify racism? How do you measure it? Right. Yeah. Um, how do you understand it? How do you prevent it? How do, how do you analyze racism as a component of public health? Those yeah, were how do you questions. how do you how do you do that? <laughs> what do Those you were do? huge like, questions that people were asking, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And really that we're still asking now because yeah. you have someone like Serena Williams, right? Yes. Who has all the money. Um, who presumably, because we think about money being related to power, has all the power over her doc, you know, what kind of doctor she has and which hospital she goes to. It's not dictated by a health plan necessarily still not being listened to, um, having a severe complication, which was made worse by the fact that her providers didn't have much respect for what she had to say about her own health history and her health care. So if that can happen, I think when that came out, people were really like, 
whoa, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not the money because I think oftentimes people will, will conflate racism and poverty because we live in a society that is really governed by racialized capitalism. And so yes. sometimes it can be hard to tease these things out, but the money doesn't save you. Right. Um, and that became very clear through Serena Williams story, but also, um, through, through other folk stories. like um, See, I've heard very um, large names of women who are affluent, women who are educated, like we, all the lists, right? They're educated. Oh, they had issues. They had money issues, all these different things. And they still had complications. They still, to your point, had healthcare providers who weren't listening to them or already had this um, preconceived notion, this bias of, well, no, we know what's best for you. You don't know, or you can handle that, or you're not really in pain, or you're not really feeling right. that, or you don't really need this and not being taken, um, the word that you used before of like the serious or not being listened to. Yeah. So I was just going to share the example also of Kira Johnson, um, the mom who gave birth at, I believe it was Cedar sinai Hospital, um, and uh, basically was in the hospital, was um, under the care of doctors. Um they knew that there was an issue going on with her, that she wasn't feeling well, that her labs weren't normal, that she was having some kind of internal issue complication, but she sat there for hours and hours and hours and bled out internally Jesus. because they kept telling her and her husband, oh, we'll get to you, we're coming. You know, By the time they got her on the operating table, she had completely bled out and died. Oh. Um, and that was in you know one of the top hospitals in the country. She's someone who you know, had access to wealth and, and good care and a supportive partner and and lost her life for absolutely no good goddamn reason. Um, and that's the kind of thing that pisses me off and kind of keeps me going. Um, and and that's just the names that we know. I mean, I could sit here and, and, and list them, yes. you know, um, Shalanda Irving, you know. Um, uh, and I also think about like Charlena Lyles in Seattle, who was gunned down by the police while pregnant. So we have to think about what is not only the role of obstetric violence, but state violence. Um, and then we have partner violence. You know, there's all of these different forms of violence that are impacting people, regardless of um, their wealth status, um, really a lot to do with their race. And so there's yeah. this unnamed thing that is the stress of being a Black person, um, and particularly a Black woman, giving birth um, in the United States. Um, there's this effect called weathering um, that actually means that we are having elevated cortisol being released, and it's, it's a hormone being released into our bloodstream on a consistent basis. Every time we go to the grocery store and someone follows us around, every time um, our white coworker reaches over to touch our hair, um, Every time someone assumes that because you have four kids, you must be on welfare. Um, every time, um, you know, your boss uh, makes a comment about your race or, or expects you to be the voice of your people. Um, you know, all of these microaggressions um, that start when we're in school, that start very young age, that accumulate cortisol and stress in the body. Um, and there was actually a study about blood pressures that showed that for Black folks, our blood pressures don't rest as much at night. So there's this thing called resting blood pressure, which is when you sleep, your blood pressure should chill out, your body system should slow down, and everything kind of repairs, you know, the stress of the day. You get to relax and sleep. And I would argue that probably many people of different you know, backgrounds and races are not having as much restful sleep these days just yeah. because of the state of our world. But it's even more compounded for Black yes. folks. Everything that, you know, the average American is stressed about, Black folks are even more stressed about because you add this layer of, and it's and it's so innate. It's not something you can change. You, you know, mm -hmm. you cannot self-select and change your race. For most of us, you know, we're not... Uh, as soon as we, we walk in anywhere, we're not passing. <laughs> we're racialized immediately. We're treated differently um, because of the color of our skin. And that and that's different for different people. The awareness level is different from di for different people. So there might be Black folks who say, well, you know, I don't really feel that impacted. But I think for the majority of us, we have stories of experiences of either ourselves, of family members who have been targeted in different ways, whether it's micro or macro aggressions because of our race. But even when you turn on the news and you have to hear about the latest killing of an unarmed black man or woman, um, 
you know, it wears on you as a racialized person because your immediate thought is that could be me, that could be my daughter, that could be my son, that could be my sister, that could be my mother. Um, those are the thoughts. And that years and years of that is called is called weathering. Um, and it wears on the body and it does impact many things, not just pregnancy, higher risk of diabetes and hypertension and, you know, many other um, types of health issues, um, even COVID complications we know disproportionately impacted and still impact Black people because of stress. Um, but pregnancy is the one we're talking about now, maternal health. And so it it is definitely impacted by this um, racialized um, stress. And so a lot of my work has been around how do we change things at a systemic level um, to prevent this type of, um, of, of trauma? Um, how do we heal generational trauma? And how do we provide care to people um, that, that also helps to heal and repair and make whole our bodies so that we can give birth in the most optimal way possible. And some of that is about birthplace, but a lot of it is about compassionate care, regardless of your, your setting where you're receiving that. And so um, one of the big campaigns that I'm doing now in Miami is called the Miami Birth Justice Initiative, and it's through my organization, Southern Birth Justice Network. And our goal is to train providers and those could be midwives, those could be doctors, nurses, medical students, um, to provide compassionate care that is centered around birth justice and that helps to connect people in deeper ways to share decision making and bodily autonomy and how they access their health care. And my fundamental belief is that pregnancy and birth and even the postpartum period have the potential to be transformative if we support people and put the systems in place that really provide what people need and deserve. Um, and I think that by doing that, we are taking a huge step um, towards uh, rectifying this situation. And a lot of that is centered in this midwifery model of care, the Black midwives model of care. And our communities have been disconnected from that because of the laws and policies that moved um, pregnancy and birth care into hospitals and really just got rid of postpartum care altogether. Um, but it moved pregnancy and birth care into clinics and hospitals and institutions and away from community. So those models of care that were really about making people whole went away with the destruction of midwives and particularly Black midwives. So a lot of my work has been like, how do we bring that back? And how do we shift our entire healthcare system to be centered around this model of making people whole or what I call holistic care. I think to add on to that, what are some questions if someone's listening to this, um, maybe they don't have access to midwife, maybe they're even a little, you know, skeptical because I think we're still, which is still mind boggling to me that, you know, um, and in the black community of, of, of especially friends that I've talked to that they're like, I don't know. I know my girlfriends when I was having a midwife, they're like, wait, is that safe? Like, what is this? You know, again, because of what society is, is taught us, what we've been programmed to think. Um, so what are some questions that black mothers, families should ask their providers and what research should do to arm themselves with information? Because I'm a big advocate for at least educating yourself. It goes back to your earlier point where you said at the end of the day, it should be a woman's choice to do what she wants point blank period I say it all the time I had a midwife um, and I and I'm an advocate for home birth but at the end of the day if you want to go into the hospital and you want an epidural do you but make sure you're making an informed choice because that's what you wanted to do and you did the research to say yep this is still going to be what's best for me so speak on that what is some education research questions that they should ask sure um, and I'll just say I I, um, I support people in all kinds of different settings um, so I, my big thing is that your choice be informed and like you said, and that you know what all your options are and that you yes. are the partner in that decision. Um, but I'm not against epidurals. I, I, in fact, recommended them for some of my clients if they've been laboring for 24, 48, 72 yeah. hours and they're just exhausted. And I just look at them and say, you need an epidural, you need to sleep. Um, yeah. And when you, when you rest, this baby's going to come. And that often happens. Um and, and so sometimes that can be the best thing for someone. The sure. problem is 
is that it's used as a tool of manipulation within yes. hospital systems. It's not yes. used to people's best interest. So that's the difference. It's how it's 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 not that the tool is evil. It's how it's used. Um, 100%. So I just wanted to say that. But the the questions. Um, that I think people should ask. I mean, well, I would say, because we probably won't have time to get through all of them. Yeah, <laughs> but high level, a few, three, yeah. This is a whole class. Um, so yeah. you can find some of uh, my videos online um, at southernbirthjustice.org, but you can also find there the Birth Justice Bill of Rights, um, okay. which is um, a model that, that I developed to help people understand not necessarily the rights that they're going to tell you you have in a hospital, but according to like basic human rights, there are 22 things that really um, our care should look like. And that if more of us demand it and, all, and more of us demand it, not just from an individual level when we're going in the hospital, but also from a policy level when we're looking at, you know, um, what these institutions look like, how they get funded, all of that, that we should be demanding um, more rights uh, for people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so these Birth Justice Bill of Rights kind of outline this. But some of those things are to receive um, culturally appropriate and congruent care. Um, and sometimes that means a provider that looks like you. Sometimes it means a provider that speaks your language. Sometimes it might mean a provider that respects your, your culture and your religion. Um, so whatever that means for you, right? A provider... Um, that is culturally appropriate and congruent. Um, also a provider that is sensitive to the racialized history of healthcare. So they need to be knowledgeable, right, about their own biases. They need to be knowledgeable about why um, a Black woman coming into their practice may not immediately trust them. Yes. Um, they need to be knowledgeable about, um, you know, what are the needs of queer families um, yes. and their transgender clients. Um, their young clients, right, um, that have may, may have needs that are different um, from the cookie cutter kind of patient that they're trained on, which is the, you know, cis, hetero, married, white woman. Um, yeah. I will say at this point in, in, in human history, um, the majority of people giving birth in the world, and yes, even in the United States of America, are not cis hetero married white women so we can move away from that being the model patient <laughs> like we're we can long put that out of of practice and have more realistic more varied more diverse understandings of the world and of the people that we're caring for um and this is when it comes to research this is when it comes to you know direct care sure. um and certainly policy um and so asking those types of questions of your provider um like, have you taken a, a, a training on um, cultural sensitivity or anti-bias is a valid question. Um, and being honest and saying, I don't trust necessarily what you're telling me because I don't trust medications because a lot of research has been done on my people that, um, you know, my grandfather was in Tuskegee, for example, sure. or, you know, whatever that family story is, my grandmother went in for a C-section and came out without a uterus. Um, being able to voice that and process that in a healthcare setting is an important part of building trust. And oftentimes providers are just rushing people in and out and not even understanding the patients that they're caring for. So I think, you know, being able to say I had a trauma of a, from a pap smear when I was 16 and I don't really like pap smears. Mm -hmm. Your provider should be able to hold space for you to process what that is and even say things to you like, do you want to insert the speculum yourself? Or you, as a as a client, should be able to make that request. I'd like to insert the speculum myself. It will make me feel safer. Demanding those types of things. I talk about liberatory pap smears, right? Because we don't often talk about pap smears as being. No, I was like, we should do that. <laughs> yeah, it's possible to have a liberatory pap, pap smear experience, and actually, you have That's the crazy. right. You have the right. To have your vagina treated the way that you want it treated in a healthcare appointment. It seems so basic. Right. I was going to say, it seems so basic, but it's like, we just not. And I think on, on a woman thing in general, like we're just, we don't like, I mean, and there's j jokes, there's memes. It's like, you know, you go to the OBGYN and I've always thought, I'm like, these are the most uncomfortable, awkward thing. I'm like, there's got to be a better way than to just sit there with my legs open. And this whole, like, it's just so uncomfortable. I'm like, this can't be life that this just, that we just don't ask questions and we don't whatever. So yeah. I'm happy that you said that, that there, that that's even a thing that you're putting that out there. Like, yes, you can yes. do that. Most people hate the stirrups more than they even hate oh, the speculum. Yes, uh, I do. It's so uncomfortable. And I try not to use stirrups if I can help it. 
Um, yeah. They're there if I need them, but most times I don't need them. It's more about communication and talking to someone about their body and how we can work together to get this procedure done that they need done. But I'm going to respect them in that process. And that's how I want people to walk away from my care feeling respected. Um, that's the goal, right? Um, right? And that should be the goal of providers, but it should also be the demand of the person seeking the care. You're paying this person to provide care for you, whether it's through your tax dollars, if you have Medicaid, or whether it's through a health plan that you pay for, or your job pays for, or your partner pays for, whatever it is, you are paying this, they're getting compensation to help you. And that should be you know, something that is respected in how they deliver the care. Um, and then so and when it comes to birth, you know, the questions that um, I want people to ask is about gravity. Um, it is the greatest tool in birth and is underused yes. and it's free. Um, so I often tell my clients that have to go see a physician for whatever reason um, and they have to make a birth plan to say, I have a really great tool that's going to help my baby come out and you don't even have to pay for it. And the physician usually looks confused. And then I tell them to say gravity. I just want to move around. I'm not a yes. prisoner. I don't want to be strapped to a bed. I want to yes. squat. I want to move. I want to walk. I want to sit on a ball. These are also basic things that have throughout human history been a part of birth that have been radically shifted out of healthcare and out of hospital birth. And it doesn't make any sense. Again, gravity is free. Um, things like skin to skin with the baby, that incubator that they put the baby in, the baby, not the incubator, the warmer that they put yes. the baby in right after birth, that thing costs so much money. It's expensive to run. I tell them you could save on your electricity by just putting the baby skin to skin with mom. You know, it is the warm place. It is where baby wants to be. We say yes. babies don't move out. They just move upstairs. Um, so oh, most of the, the things that we can ask for in a care setting are very uh, low intervention, they don't require additional training. They're basically common sense and they are low cost. Um, and so that's the message I'm really trying to get across to hospital-based sure. providers um, and also to people seeking care in hospitals that we can ask for these things. We can demand these things and they're not unreasonable nor are they difficult to do. Um, so I try in my classes um, and um, in the with the doulas that I train, the midwives that I mentor to to try to spread this message that um, birth justice is a model that is implementable, it is low cost, um, and it is the best way to support the rights of pregnant and birthing people. But I think it goes to your original point that still that we know that the providers should do that, but then and we can argue, and not us, but they, whoever, can argue that, but how can that be when we know hospitals are for profit? So anything, I don't care what, any, anything that is for profit, you're going to have issues because they're not always going to do it. I, I should say well, most of the time, they're not going to do it for the benefit of their patient, for the benefit of whoever it is, if it's a, a for profit institution. So I think it goes to your initial point that they should be, but really it, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's awesome that there are women like yourself and there, there's organizations, which we're now going to touch upon, um, that can give this kind of education because I think you do need to know that. I think that's so key, though, that you said about the whole bias because I've been part of a DEI organization um, or committee of an organization for six years and did many presentations on biases and microaggressions and all these things. And I never looked at it on a provider level, but it's so true, right? Because we all have preconceived notions, biases, whatever you want to call it, a prejudice. It just is what it is. I think it's what you do with it. It's it's whether or not it's going to be used for an, in, an affair, in a nefarious way. Is it going to be what all of that comes after? But we all have it. When we see someone, an immediate thing comes. So if you're a healthcare provider, just as we say, if it's a, a police officer, whoever it is, if you're in the care of servicing a community, but you've been um as well as programs as this healthcare provider service provider community provider provider whatever you want to call it to have these preconceived notions about the people you're supposed to be protecting caring for of course there's going to be a um a conflict of interest yeah it's going to be a conflict of interest if you've always been told xyz about the person that you're supposed to take care of so i think that's ingenious to say that hospitals should have it and not uh 
you know, wham, bam, answer these questions, but truly understanding, having to be an ally, what that means and to say, okay, let me recognize my own bias. That doesn't make me a bad person. Again, it's something I've been programmed with, whether indirectly or directly. Now, how do I reset it and go move forward from it. So I, I love that you said that because I think that is a key component that we don't talk about often. We talk about the racism being there, but we all have it. So it's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, I'm a Latin woman. We we all have our preconceived notions, whatever we say. So it shouldn't be ashamed of. I think it has to be recognized. I think it has to be to acknowledge it, you know, and say, yes, this is what it is. But now how can we move forward? Like, okay, no matter what, we're, you're not a bad person. So thank you for mentioning that because I think that's so key. But I really want to dive into before we, we wind up here because I feel like I could talk to you for so long because of the work that you're doing. And it is something that I'm um, passionate about as well to get the word out. Talk to me about the Southern Birth Justice Network. I know you mentioned it a few times, as well as the National Black Midwives Alliance, kind of high level, you know, what's their main mission, what you want people to understand. And like I said, in the show notes, people will have access to them. But mm -hmm. what do you really want people to know that they're there for, basically? Sure. Um, so Southern Birth Justice Network is a nonprofit organization um, 501c3 to, um, and it was established to um, build a movement for birth justice. Um, and so we do that through training, through community organizing, through educating um, folks in our community about their rights. Um, we started really as a mobile unit um, going to provide prenatal care in communities that don't have access to midwives. Um, and then we developed a birth justice workshop to educate um, the entire community about what birth justice is, what your rights are as an individual, and how we can work together to affect systemic change. Um, and we've been on that mission for about 14 years now wow. um, of really like raising this banner. And, and um, I like to think that we really seeded and populated the um, birth justice movement because now you're hearing... Sure birth justice more as a term, um, but we were the first to do a birth justice um, workshop and to develop the birth justice framework um, to really launch that um, into, um, into the public. And super proud of that um, and of the team Amazing. that we built. Um, we now do doula training. So we just trained 38 doulas um, wow. and our doulas are called birth justice doulas. They do a year long program and become certified as birth justice doulas. Um, we also do policy advocacy. So we're often active at the Capitol um, as well as locally. I mentioned the Miami Birth Justice Initiative, which is one of our big campaigns. We're working on launching a pilot doula program there where we're hoping that um, every, um, every person that comes into Jackson Memorial Hospital, which is our main hospital in Miami, it's also the third largest hospital system in the country. So we're hoping that every person that walks through the doors of Jackson that is pregnant um, and ready to give birth will have access to a doula in the next couple of wow. years. Um, we are also working with medical students. Um, so one of the things that we fundamentally believe that um, a lot of people will say that um, there's this war between obstetricians and midwives, and we yes. don't really believe that. We actually believe that there's a healing that needs to happen between mm -hmm. OBs and midwives and even different types of midwives, like nurse midwives sure. versus home birth midwives, um, and that that healing really comes through understanding the history of um, obstetric care, um, and which I think a lot of people don't know that yeah. obstetric care was founded on the bodies of Black women by white male enslavers, um, and that it became a model of care that really consolidated white male power around reproductive health. Um, so whereas reproductive health really used to be the domain of women and healers, um, it became the domain of white male doctors. And that, um, that movement of kind of taking um, reproductive health, not just birth, because they also targeted abortion, sure birth control and all kinds of oh, things. So many things. Yes. And there and and we know they're still doing that, especially yeah. we're in the state of Florida, um, where they're restricting, you know, reproductive rights, restricting abortion access, restricting yeah. young people's autonomy over their bodies, um, trans people's autonomy over their bodies. We yeah. see that happening. And um 
And so there's a conversation to be had among all types of perinatal health providers. Um, and so we're trying to facilitate that conversation by working with medical students, doctors, nurses, et cetera, um, to kind of examine what is this story around reproductive health and how can we work together to create something that is more transformative and healing and holistic and really what people need and deserve. And I think when I talk to a lot of um, doctors um, and particularly medical students, they want to transform it. They just feel powerless. It's a system. And like you said, it's a for-profit system. And so it can be hard to think about how do we transform this very big machine, but it's not impossible. And our fundamental belief at Southern Birth Justice Network is not only is it possible, but we are building a movement to get it done and it's going to take all of us to do it. Um, so we need the thinkers and the policymakers and the economists and the researchers and the activists and the doulas and the midwives and everybody to put our heads together and come up with the solutions. And some of the solutions are things that we are already accomplishing. Like uh, we were really instrumental um, in working with some of our coalition partners in getting postpartum Medicaid coverage passed wow. in 2021. Uh, we also worked on an anti-shackling bill um, many years ago here in Florida, where they were shackling um, pregnant people and, and birthing people in um, jails and prisons. And now there's a law in Florida that says they cannot do that. Um, that was some of our work. Um, we also yeah. are pushing forward um, systemic change in schools around pregnant pregnancy policies for young people that are pregnant. Um, we are working um, with the hospitals to try to get them to adopt the Birth Justice Bill of Rights as part of how they welcome their clients. So hello, welcome to our hospital. And here's a list of your rights. Um, yeah. Should be how people are received so that even if they have a biased provider or a nurse that's telling them if you move, your baby's going to die, they can demand another provider. You always have a right to a second opinion. You have a right sure. to ask for a different provider if the one that is attending to you is not respecting you or is somehow violating your rights. Um, and that's why we want people to have doulas so they have an advocate in the room. Yes. You know, a midwife is a, is a healthcare provider. A doula is a healthcare advocate. Um, and so we want um, people to have both. We want them to be able to choose a midwife, choose a doula, choose an OB, whoever they want to have, but that that provider be someone who respects them. And if it, that provider is not someone who respects them, then they can, mm -hmm. can request a different provider. Um, and so that's a huge part of our work is the Miami Birth Justice Initiative, our doula training, our policy advocacy. Um, we're also um, we're also doing national work around um, abortion access and trying to get our curriculum out there um, to more providers, not just in Florida, but nationally as well. We have also started doing some international work. Um, working with midwives and birth workers in other countries because we recognize that this is a global issue, that obstetric violence is occurring in every nation on this planet, um, and that the midwives are being pushed out of their communities in every nation and every community on this planet. And so there's a movement to build for global birth justice beyond the borders of the United States, even though that's this is where we're based. Um, so that's Southern Birth Justice Network in a nutshell. Um, and then one of the projects that has been birthed out of Southern Birth Justice Network is National Black Midwives Alliance, because we recognize that there are not enough providers um, that are Black, and that to solve the Black maternal health care crisis, we are going to need Black midwives. Um, less than 7% of the midwives in the United States are Black, and that is a, that is a travesty. It is also um, intentional. Um, meaning that it was designed that way um, by the United States government, by state governments, um, by the American Medical Association, that all targeted Black midwives um, who were the primary care providers for pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and um, young families um, for many centuries in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and that when hospitals, um, when birth started to move into hospitals, midwives started to be pushed out of communities. And so at National Black Midwives Alliance, we are reclaiming that story um, and deciding that in order to solve this crisis, that we need more of us. So we have a mentorship program um, where we've mentored over 60 um, Black midwifery students. Um, we have a, a documentary that we're working on to be able to tell the stories 
of Black midwives and how they are serving their communities, and to also honor the legacy of Black midwives because Black midwifery has been foundational to the United States. Black midwives historically attended every race of person, particularly in the South. Um, when you look at the early midwife census of the 20th century, um, the early 20th century in Florida, 95 plus percent of those midwives were Black. Um, that was over 4,000 midwives. Today, we have um, you know only a few hundred midwives. And that had everything to do with the criminalization of midwifery that was intentionally pushing Black midwives out. And so we want to tell that story, but to tell it in a liberatory way that reclaims it and shows how Black midwives are changing and transforming our communities today. Uh, we also are launching a scholarship program because we want to financially support Black student midwives as well. And also we are we are establishing a National Day for Black Midwives, March 14th of 2023, will be Black Midwives Day. And it's an opportunity to uplift, celebrate, and honor the contributions of Black midwives to the United States of America. Oh, I love it. I, like I said, I feel like we could talk forever and there's so much. I'm like, I want to be like, how do you juggle all of these things? But I know we have wind down. Two more questions. One, how people can connect with you. Again, I'll put it in the show notes, but if you want to quickly, how people can connect, maybe go to the website and then your final thoughts to the podcast YouTube community. Okay. So the best way to connect with me is through um, either the social media or the website. So for Southern Birth Justice Network, it is southernbirthjustice.org um, or at Southern Birth Justice on Instagram. And for Black Midwives, National Black Midwives Alliance, it is blackmidwivesalliance.org or at Black Midwives Alliance on Instagram. Those are the best ways to find me. We're also on Twitter and Facebook and all the things. And final thoughts. <laughs> um, so I look at this model of care as being a full spectrum model, um, which, and I think it's really important to say that right now is yes. in particular, um, that we are not birthers. We are not abortionists. We are whole people. And we have reproductive health needs that vary at different points in our lives for different reasons. And we're at whatever point we're at on that spectrum, we deserve access to the best care, the care that fits us culturally, that fits us holistically, that honors our needs mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and socially. We deserve that. Um, and forced uh, pregnancy is wrong. It is a violation of human rights. Um, and I really believe that birth has a potential to be transformative, but for me, transformative birth, the premise of transformative birth is really consensual pregnancy. Um, so we have to be taking care of people as whole people, uh, which means that our laws, our policies, and our access has to meet the needs of where people are at versus, you know, one subset of people imposing religious or political beliefs on others. Um, so I think those of us who are aligned with that and who believe that need to be more vocal um, and, and really raise our voices, um, connect with an organization that's already doing this work in your community, particularly organizations that are BIPOC-led, that are um, you know, really aligned with models of justice, um, and that are, are you know, looking to transform not only the healthcare system, but also the entire um, you know, global system that um, has led to kind of this racialized oppression that we talk about, because it's really about transforming all of it. We're looking at pregnancy and birth under a microscope, but it's really part of this larger macro system um, where we need to honor human rights. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that I think when it comes to birth and, and transformation, there's, there's this access to magic that you get when you're a birthing person. And I think because of the medical model and the way that most people, 98% of people give birth in hospitals, right, um, that we're missing the magic of that moment where you yes. get to be the most fucking powerful person on the planet. Um, 
And when you can birth that way, you can mother that way, you can yes. build your family that way, you can build yes. your community that way, and you can really transform so many aspects of your own life and of the world. And I'm not saying that if you miss the boat or miss that moment, you can't do those things. I am right. saying that there's an access point through birth that most people who have done it will say is the most powerful thing they've ever done. And so oh. that access point is something that every person should be at least given the opportunity to go through that portal. Yes. Um, and most people today are not being given that access to go through that portal. So I, that's what I what um, birth justice is really about to me is consensual pregnancy that leads to transformative birth and going through this magical portal. I know it sounds very like out no, here. it's a hundred percent. It's I think when I remember seeing YouTube videos of and and hearing even my own family members and even women actually on my podcast that had traumatic birth experiences and I'm like God, what are we missing as a country that we're just allowing these birth stories to be so traumatic and you know all the things that we've been talking about this last hour and so and I'm like when that's the most magical it should be the most magical moment of a woman's life and to your point just because you missed that doesn't mean it can't continue to be yeah. but then I think then there's so many levels that then come and follow after that and if it's yeah. continued to take away where that I mean we could even talk about you know how fathers aren't allowed you know I mean again a whole nother thing but it is it is a magical portal like you're giving birth like <laughs> You know, like it's 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 the miracle of life, God, whatever it, whatever you want to believe, higher power, source, energy. Um, so no, you that's I, I, like no. 100%. The magical portal is real, and if you yes. didn't get to go through the magical portal, it's okay, because yes. healing is also a magical portal, right? Yes. And and so that that's what I would encourage anyone who hears this and is like, damn, well, I missed that boat. Tap into healing. You know, yes. tell your birth story, process it with a trusted person. Yes. Um, find the nuggets of wisdom within your story. Integration. You know, we often like the trauma lives outside of ourselves, but when we can integrate it and become more, more of who we are, because all of it is our story, right? So I don't want anyone to hear this and be like, well, I didn't get that. No, um, because I think there's also this like mommy war guilt thing that goes on. Um, and that's, yeah. that's not where I'm trying to say, like, you have to give birth naturally. No. I am no. saying that it's an opportunity. It's an invitation and more people should have access to that opportunity and that invitation. And if they don't, then they should be given access to the tools they need to heal whatever birth trauma they experienced. And these are human rights for all people. Yes. Oh my God. Thank you, Jamar. It's been such a pleasure, such an honor to have you on. Um, continue to do the work that you're doing, putting out to the world. It's absolutely fantastic. I am honored to be able to share your story on my platform. I think it's so important to do. It starts with education. It starts with conversation. So continued blessings to you for love and light. Thank you so much. This was fun.